Thich Han said. Remember when he was asked what's the most important thing we can do for the sake of life on earth? And I think his questioners were asking, you know, should we work in the system or sit on a zafu or meditate or climb the barricades? He didn't go strategic at all. He said, what we most need to do is to hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. To hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. Every spiritual tradition somewhere in it has a comment or a story or a metaphor about mistaken identity. And this incredible crisis for uh, conscious life on planet Earth can be understood as that, that we've been thinking that we were consumers. We've been thinking that we were laborers in the uh, machines of the industrial growth society. We were thinking that we had to get, a get, get ahead as separate selves compete, win, look out for number one, all the time imprisoned in this shrink, shrunken sense of self. And now this crisis is telling us, sort of slapping us in the face, saying, wake up, you are life on earth. We are living members of a living planet, we're like cells in a living body. That body is being traumatized. So of course we feel it, of course. It arises from our profound caring and that caring is grounded in our interconnectedness with all life, our interexistence with all life. And that's been true for life since the beginning of space time. We forgot it for a while. We began to exploit each other and the earth for separate advantage and greed and fear grew. But so what, um, what the mainstream society would have us think of as, oh, some personal neurotic response and have us reduce our grief to a kind of um, private nothing neurosis is actually uh, when we behold it and walk through it, it becomes a doorway into a vaster realization of a life and of our identity, our interexistence with all life. So that's why I think that the, the crisis itself is both the uh, mirrors the mistake we've made, but it also becomes an opportunity for our awakening. And that's why I've come to think that maybe the first step on their way to the awakening is the simple act of being glad you're alive. What a magic that is. Just to stop for a minute. That in itself is a politically subversive act because we're taught so much dissatisfaction. And that results in self-deprecation, self-loathing in a way, and the loneliness. But to pause, as in every spiritual tradition, and at the beginning of every spiritual tradition, there was this, oh, wow, get a load of this, hallelujah. <laughs> I didn't create this, but here I am. I have hands. I have breath. I have eyes that can see. <laughs> there are trees out there. Oh, here's another person talking to me. Wow. There's the sun and the moon. So simple. So that act of saying, oh, thanks to life, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be in circumstances you approve of to feel that way, you know. 
then fear finding the uh, readiness and the will and the tenderness to uh, look at the suffering. And I like that about the Buddha's teachings. He just began right off with that. Didn't mince words. Suffering is. And you're not going to make things better by running from it or printing it, pretending it's other. Just be with it. And then you see when you feel grounded in gratitude, just even a little bit, so that the panic just subsides. You open the eyes. Then you can feel held enough by life to notice and be present with what is also there and what you've been carrying around, maybe for as long as you can remember. But you can't talk about it, usually. Mainstream society doesn't want to hear about our sorrow for what is happening to life on Earth. That gets reduced right away to some personal pathology. They don't want mainstream society, the consumer society. They say, go out and shop. Go shopping. Really, we want to go cry. And that, in all the spiritual traditions, there's been place for mourning. Tears that cleanse. Hearts that open and get washed together and words that get spoken of our anguish. What a deliverance to realize that that's not a private burden, but a shared experience with our brothers and sisters. When we're suffering massive collective trauma, there's always choice. There's a choice about how we relate to suffering. Seems to me there are two ways. One is that we can let that suffering open us up to each other and bond us in greater trust and collaboration shared strength, or we can let it divide us into feuding and conflict and bitterness. Quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. And as you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the changes. What's it like, this intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow. And to the rushing water speak, I am. I didn't create this body that stood by me so well for over 80 years. Nor did I create the conditions that over billions of years nurtured life to allow uh, you and me to emerge in this time. So there's a kind of a mystery uh, to that and to be alive now when uh, things are really dicey. Whoa, I mean, uh, we are causing the unraveling of uh, life systems, of species and ecosystems, 
of uh, the vast interplay of microbial, hydrological cycles, climate that uh, is unhinging life on Earth. If you want an adventure, boy, what a time to choose to be alive, to get a chance to uh, find out what you have inside you in terms of vitality and alertness and courage, what you have to discover in terms of what we can do together. We have to build new and let emerge new sustainable ways of doing things. And they are. They're coming forward with such ingenuity. So many new ways sprouting up. That's essential for life to go on. It's like the old Wobblies uh, motto, building the new within the shell of the old. Don't pour all your energy into defeating uh, what's already defeating itself at the core, but build living, living economies, living ways of producing food, the food revolution and the diff change in holding the land. Changes, basic changes in our judicial system, restorative circles. Basic changes in how we understand and measure our wealth and prosperity. Deep cha biggest changes than we've seen in thousands of years, I think. And then changing our minds. With it all, this awakening to our true identity. Hope and hopelessness, they're just feelings. They rise and pass. Sometimes I feel hopeful. Sometimes I feel helpless. Sometimes it has to do with what I had for breakfast or what somebody just said to me. Uh, so the... Um, the greatest gift we can give our world is our full presence and our choice moment by moment to be present, to stay open. And um, when you're in the middle of a big adventure, you don't have time to decide whether you're hopeful or hopeless. You know, David going out with his slingshot. To, I would say, excuse me, I'd like to know, are you feeling hopeful? Or, excuse me, Frodo and Sam, how hopeful do you feel today? Ah, we just got a job to do. Don't waste my time. That question can bring you out of the present moment. It can throw you into imaginings and con conjectures when all your energy should be right here in the moment. I see us on the way into the future as walking always with uncertainty. We don't know whether the great unraveling or the great turning is going to be the end of the story. But I know where I want to get behind. And I know that people that I love and link arms with get behind. And as we walk toward the possibility of a life-sustaining society, we're on a path together, but we better link arms because there's a ditch on either side of this road. And one ditch is paralysis, shutting down because we feel too puny and too guilty and too weak to see what's happening or too victimized. And the other ditch is panic. And there's enough social hysteria going around nowadays that, the, that right-wing politicians are exacerbating and using. I don't think we need to scold people. People know that the whole life on Earth is in danger. They are aware of it in their bodies at any rate. Help them feel the strength to feel life within them and move together 
and make that choice. It's a choice that has to be made minute by minute. That's where your urgency comes in. I was raised in the church. I loved it. It was a place where my family could go and say nice things instead of being mean to each other. <laughs> and I loved the music, and we had a, it was a great Protestant, liberal Protestant theology of a loving God. Um, but then when I prepared to study for a life in the church, uh, I couldn't take the theorizing uh, which was highly patriarchal and hierarchical, and I walked out. And uh, I missed it all, oh, because I'd been crazy about God and Jesus, and I was missing it, until uh, I came upon uh, Rilke in a bookstore in Munich. I was already a young mother. I was there, and I picked up this book of hours, Das Stundenbuch, and it fell open to the second poem. Yeah. Ich lebe mein Leben in wachsenden Ringen. I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not complete this last one, but I give myself to it. I've been circling around God that primordial tower I've been circling for thousands of years, and I still don't know. Am I a falcon, a storm, or a great song? Hello. <laughs> Hello, wife. <laughs> Whoa. God's everywhere. Yeah, but it's a different God, and that meant so much, you know. Uh, I think it's the very next poem in the Book of Hours, Rilke said, You, the mist that brought forth the morning. That's the image he uses. Not a king on a throne, but the mist that brings forth the morning. I would sing your praises not with gold leaf on parchment, but with a colors of apple bark, you know. A God you meet in darkness. A God who uh, surprises you into uh, tears. A God that calls you to love the thing. So that call and the condition of our world meet. There's the poetry. Poetry helps so much because expository prose, that gets caught in old thought forms. It's almost sometimes like looking in a rearview mirror. But listen to this. Dear darkening ground, you've endured so patiently the walls we've built. See, he's talking to God as if God were the earth. It merges, as it has for me. The object of my devotion and joy is the living earth itself. And so that's okay with God. <laughs> but it said, um, Dear darkening ground, you've endured so patiently the walls we built. Perhaps you'll give the cities one more hour. And the churches and cloisters too. And maybe those that labor, you'll let their work still grip them for another five hours or seven before you become forest again and water and wilderness in that hour of inconceivable terror where you take back your name from all things. Oh, just give me a little more time. I just want a little more time because I'm going to love the things. I'm going to love the things as no one has thought to love them until they're real and ripe and worthy of us. 
well, what a better thing to do? How can you have a great turning unless you love it all into being? Don't let urgency deprive you of the capacity to let life through in the biggest doorway of your being. <laughs>